Calvin left Paris, went to Saint-Ange, and assisted one of his friends, at whose request he composed some short Christian exhortations, which were presented to certain parishes to be read as homilies, that the people might gradually be enticed to a zeal in the investigation of the truth. About this time he came to Nirac in Gascony on a visit to James Lefebvre of Estaples, now far advanced in years, who had been defended by the same Queen of Navarre. When in danger of his life from the vain and foolish doctors of the Sorbonne, for his having introduced great improvements in mathematics and other branches of philosophy in the University of Paris, after a long and very violent opposition, and for his assisting to rout out the scholastic theology, she had also provided for him in Iraq a town within her jurisdiction. The good old man received and saw a young Calvin with great kindness and predicted that he would become a distinguished instrument in restoring the kingdom of heaven in France. Not long after Calvin returned to Paris, as if called there by the hand of God himself, for the impious Servetus was even then disseminating his heretical poison against the sacred trinity in that city. He professed to desire nothing more earnestly than to have an opportunity for entering into discussion with Calvin, who waited long for Servetus, the place and time for an interview having been appointed, with great danger to his own life, since he was at that time under the necessity of being concealed on account of the incest rage of his adversaries. Calvin was disappointed in his expectations of meeting Servetus, who wanted courage to endure even the sight of his opponent. The year 1534 was distinguished by many horrid cruelties inflicted upon the reformers. Gerard de Rousel, doctor of the Sorbonne, affording at that time great assistance to the study of religion, and Corot of the Order of St. Augustine, who having been for two years under the patronage of the Queen of Navarre, promoted very much the cause of the gospel in Paris, were not, were not only dragged out of their pulpits, but thrown into prison. The, indig the indignation of the infatuated Francis I was so much enraged on account of certain papers against the mass dispersed through, through the city and affixed to his chamber door that having appointed a public procession, he walked uncovered before it, bearing a lighted torch, as if in expiation of the crime accompanied by his three sons. He ordered eight martyrs to be burned alive in four principal quarters of the city and declared with a solemn oath that he would not spare his own children if by any chance infected with these, as he called them, most execrable heresies. Calvin, beholding with grief such, as, such a spectacle of woe, determined to leave France. After he had first published at Orleans an excellent little work entitled Psychopanachia, against an error, error which commenced in the earliest ages of the church and was again revived by those who taught that the soul sleeps when in a state of separation from the body. With an intention of leaving France, he went by way of Lorraine toward Basel with the young gentleman at whose house, as already stated, he resided at Saint-Ange. Near Metz he was plundered by a servant who saddled one of the strongest horses and fled with so much speed that he could not, not be apprehended 
after he had perfidiously robbed his masters of all things necessary for their journey and reduced them to great difficulties. The other servant, however, lent them ten crowns, which enabled them to proceed with considerable inconvenience to Strasbourg and thence to Basel. He formed an intimate friendship in this city with Simon Grinet and Wolfgang Capito, men of the greatest celebrity, and devoted himself to the study of the Hebrew language. Through very desirous, though very desirous to do his utmost that he might remain in obscurity, as appears from one of Bucer's letters to Calvin the following year, he was under the necessity of publishing what he called the Institutes of the Christian Religion, and the rudiment of much the largest of his works, for when the German princes, who had supported the gospel, and whose friendship he then courted, were indignant at Francis I for the murder of his Protestant subjects. The only wise remedy proposed by Belay Lange, which he resolved to adopt, was his declaration that he had merely punished the Anabaptists, who boast only in their own spirit as the divine word, and despise all magistrates. Calvin, feeling indignant at the calumny with which the new religion was branded, seized this opportunity for publishing what I consider an incomparable work. He prefixed also an admirable preface to the king himself, and if he could from any circumstance have been induced to read it, I am either very much mistaken or a great wound would, even at that period, have been inflicted on the whore of Babylon. For the king differed in many respects from his successors. He was a very acute judge of the situation of affairs, possessed an excellent talent in detecting the truth, was a patron of learned men, and his inclination did not lead him to hate persons of the reformed religion. But neither his own sins nor the sins of his people which were even then menaced with the speedy arrival of God's indignation, allowed him to hear, much less to read, this work. After completing his institutes and faithfully performing the duties he owed his native country, he felt a desire to pay, as if at a distance, his respects to Italy, and to visit René, the Duchess of Ferrara, the do and daughter of Louis the Twelfth, King of France, whose piety was at that time very much praised. He therefore waited upon her, and at the same time so confirmed her in a sincere zeal for religion, to the utmost of his abilities according to the existing state of affairs, that she continued ev ever after to entertain a sincere affection for him during his life and now also, as his survivor, exhibits striking marks of her gratitude after his death. From Italy, whose territories he entered, to use his own language, only that he might leave them, Calvin returned to France, where he settled all his affairs, and brought along with him Anthony Calvin, his only surviving brother. His intention was to return to Basel or Strasbourg, but the wars compelled him to make his route through Dauphiny and Savoy, all other countries having been completely closed against his passage. This was the cause of his coming without his own intention to Geneva, where, as future events proved, he was conducted by a divine hand. For the gospel had a short time before been wonderfully introduced into that city by the joint exertions of two very distinguished characters. William Farrell, a gentleman of Dauphiny, educated, not in a monastery, as was reported by some, but in the Academy of James Faber of Estaples, and Peter Viret, of Orb in the territory of Bern, and Freiburg, 
whose labors were afterwards most abundantly blessed of the Lord. Calvin, passing through Geneva, visited these good men as a matter of course, on which occasion Pharaoh, with his usual heroic spirit, after urging him at some length to continue and share their labors at Geneva, without going farther, thus addressed Calvin when he manifested no disposition to comply with the proposal. I denounce unto you, in the name of Almighty God, that if, under the pretext of prosecuting your studies, you refuse to labor with us in this work of the Lord, the Lord will curse you as seeking yourself rather than Christ. Calvin, terrified by this dreadful denunciation, surrendered, surrendered himself to the disposal of the presbytery, presbytery and magistrates, by whose votes and the consent of the people he was chosen not only preacher, which at first he had refused, but also appointed professor of divinity, which office he accepted in the month of August, 1536. This year is also distinguished by a closer alliance between Geneva and Bern, and by the accession of Lausanne to Christ, where a free disputation was held against the Catholics, which Calvin also attended. Calvin then published a certain formulary of doctrine suited to the state of the Church of Geneva which was only just emerging from the corruptions of popery. He added also a catechism, not, as it is now, distinguished into questions and answers, but much shorter comprising the chief articles of religion. Afterwards, he endeavored, in conjunction with Farrell and Corot, to settle the state of the church in Geneva. The greater part of his colleagues, from timidity avoiding all disturbance, while some even secretly opposed the work of the Lord, which Calvin beheld with deep concern. He induced the citizens to convene an assembly of the whole people for the purpose of openly abjuring popery and of swearing to the Christian doctrine and discipline included in a few articles. Many refused to do this in a city not yet completely liberated from the artifices of the Duke of Savoy and from the yoke of Antichrist and where various factions still continued to rage. On the 20th of July, however, in the year 1537, so the 20th July 1537, the Lord granted that the Senate and people of Geneva, openly preceded by a public scribe, should swear to the articles both of the doctrine and discipline of the Christian religion. But Satan, exasperated by such proceedings and expecting that he should be able, under the pretext of religion, to accomplish what he had in an infinite variety of ways attempted by means of foreign enemies without effect, excited the Anabaptists in the first place to oppose them and afterwards Peter Caroli, whose character and conduct will be examined in the sequel, were not only prepared to disturb, but also entirely to destroy and to subvert, subvert the work of the Lord, either because what had now been effected very much displeased Satan, or else he anticipated the results which followed. But as the event itself proved, the Lord had prevented his schemes, for Calvin and his colleagues summoned the Anabaptists to a public and free disputation, and confuted them on the 18th of March in the year 1537 from the word of God alone, in so forcible a manner, and with such uncommon success, that from this time they almost entirely disappeared in the Church of Geneva. Peter Caroli the other disturber of the church excited greater and more long continued disturbances the principle of which I will here merely state 
since the whole history of the controversy may be fully collected from one of Calvin's letters to Grenet. The Sorbonne, which had nurtured this excessively impudent person, afterwards expelled him as an heretic, though his conduct had not merited such treatment at her hands. He first came to Geneva, then to Lausanne, and afterwards Nucatel. The spirit of Satan always so accompanying him that in every place he left the impressions of certain marks of his mean and base conduct. On finding himself convicted by the Protestants, he passed over to the Catholics, and afterwards deserting them, again joined the Reformers. As Farrell clearly describes his arts in a long letter written to Calvin, at least he openly began to accuse everyone distinguished for excellence of character but particularly charged Farrell, Calvin, and Verret, as if they entertained false notions concerning the sacred trinity. A very full synod was held at Bern to consider the truth of the accusation, by which Peter Caroli was proved guilty of, of calumny. He afterwards gradually deserted the Protestants and went to Metz, having been suborned for the purpose of impeding the work of the Lord begun with so much success in that city by Pharaoh. After this he wrote a letter in which he openly attacked the reformed that the hungry dog having excited undoubted hopes of his apostasy might gain a living. He was however sent back to Rome to make a public confession of his conduct to the beast itself, where being treated with contempt and suffering both from poverty and a loathsome disease, he was received with difficulty into a hospital, and the wages of sin, death, was paid him even by the son of sin. Such was the end of this unhappy person. In the meantime, Calvin published two very elegant letters in the year 1537, because he observed many in France to be well acquainted indeed with divine truth in their minds, who still indulge their own corrupt feelings under the pretense of its being sufficient to worship Christ in the heart while they attended Mass. One was directed to Nicholas Keminus, of Orleans concerning the necessity of avoiding idolatry, whose friendship and hospitality he had very much enjoyed at Orleans, and who was afterwards appointed to a civil office in the province of Lemaine. Another related to the popish priesthood, written to Gerard Rassel, already mentioned, who after the tumult at Paris was first presented with an abbacy, and then a bishopric, and afterwards so far from pursuing the even tenor of his Christian course, gradually undermined as domestic chaplain the faith of the Queen of Navarre. But violent domestic seditions were raised against Calvin whilst engaged in these labors. The Gospel as we have already stated, had been received into the city and popery abjured. But many disgraceful crimes still continued to reign among various persons in a city which had been for so many years under the power of monks and of a profligate clergy and ancient quarrels which commenced during the wars with the Duke of Savoy were still fostered among some of the principal families. He first endeavored, without affecting anything, to remove these disorders by gentle admonition, afterwards by severely reproving the stubborn and refractory. The evil increased so much that the city was divided by the seditious conduct of private individuals into various factions, and a considerable number altogether refused to join that body of the people 
who had abjured popery. At last, affairs came to such a height that Pharaoh, Calvin, and Corot, who, as we have already stated, after boldly defending the truth at Paris, was brought by Calvin first to Basel and afterwards to Geneva when he himself was settled there, openly testified that they could not properly administer the Lord's Supper to citizens who lived in such a state of discord and were so utterly averse to all church discipline. To this also was added another evil, the disagreement of the Church of Geneva with that of Bern in certain rites. The churches of Geneva not only used common bread, but had removed all baptismal fonts, as they are called, considering them unnecessary for performing the office of baptism, and had abolished all festivals except Sunday. The Synod, the synod of Lausanne, compelled by the people of Bern, had decided that Geneva should be requested to restore the use of unleavened bread, the baptismal fonts, and the festivals. The College of the Ministers of Geneva considered it, considered it right that an audience should be afforded, and on this account another synod was convened at Zurich. Those who had been elected syndics at that time for this highest office in Geneva is appointed annually, embracing this as a favorable opportunity, became the leaders of the seditious and factious part of the city, and assembled the people. They brought affairs to such a state that while Calvin and the rest of his colleagues, who held the same views, offered in vain to assign a reason for their conduct, these three faithful servants of God in consequence of the more virtuous party being outvoted, were ordered to leave this city within two days for refusing to administer the Lord's Supper. When Calvin was informed of the decree of banishment, he said, Certainly, had I been in the service of men, this would have been a bad reward. But it is well that I have served him, who never fails to repay his servants whatever he has once promised. That was Calvin, according to Spahn, had borne his own expenses without receiving any salary. Lord willing, we'll continue in the next video.